we do come to worship and adore you this morning. We praise your holy name. We love you. And we love to be in fellowship so that we might worship you together and raise our collective voices, our collective hearts to heaven that you might be honored. And that this time here in this building, in this sanctuary, there might rise from it a sweet aroma to you, dear Lord, and that we might be blessed as we bless you. Meet with us now and speak into our lives that we might be overwhelmed by the presence of Jesus Christ and fall more deeply in love with him today than we were yesterday. For we ask these things in Christ's name. Amen. You may be seated, sorry.
My wife is so excited to do Turn to Church. It's ridiculous. <laughs> Boy, I hope those boys are here this morning. We'll see what she says in a half an hour. <laughs> hey, listen, if you got your penny saver, your Mark Morris penny saver this week, you gotta be, you gotta be pumped. You know what that means? For those of you who are older might not know what that means. That means you're you're filled up with excitement, you're pumped up, or you, you, the juices are flowing because in the penny saver this week is a quarter pay dad about our candlelight service. You know what that means? That means everybody in Mount Morris who sees a penny saver and actually looks at it, they're just coming through it, they're gonna know we're here. Amen. Amen. And what's even think about now, think about this now. Suppose we only got one percent of all penny saver readers to respond and come here Christmas Eve. You know what the problem would be? Couldn't fit them in. What a wonderful problem I could be, eh? But we'll be praising God for every soul that comes. So I'm excited about it. I'm really, I'm, I really am pumped about it. It's a good thing. And this is a bar I, I'm excited. I don't, I'm out of the information loop highway on what we've got up for sleep and ministry. We'll have to hear that. <laughs> we'll have to hear more. I'm liking it though. Praise God. Uh, Isaiah 64. Yeah, sure, Ed. Um, it doesn't sound very positive, hopeful, or joyful, that's for sure. But that's where we're going to begin. Uh, because it really isn't very joyful. And it isn't really very hopeful. It is, as we look at verse... Uh, Verse 11 of 64, all that we treasured lies in ruins. That's really what Isaiah is sharing. The hope of God bringing his people back because of their sin they've been carried off into captivity. The city of Jerusalem has been destroyed. The people have been dispersed. Gentile peoples have been brought into Jerusalem and its surrounding area. It's not a very hopeful picture. It's not a very bright picture. It's not the kind of picture that you get excited about. And so when he begins in 64, he says, he's pleading, he's praying. He's saying, we are desperate. We are lost. We are dispersed. We, we are... The way we were, you, as you intended, is gone because we've sinned against you, God. It's similar to what we talked about this morning in Sunday school. The dream of what we used to be is there, but the reality is that everything that we treasure lies in ruins. Everything that we thought was important is gone. And so we plead to you, O oh God, 64 and verse 1, that you would rent the heavens. Do you know that is? Just tear the heavens apart and come down. Come down, God. Come down. Restore us. Come down. Life is not good without you. So split the heavens wide and come down. He's praying for the Messiah to come and return the people to a restored place. It is, in a kind of a broad sense, a prophetic chapter. When you come down, the mountains would tremble before you as a fire sets twigs ablaze and causes water to boil. Come down, he pleads to God, come down. You are absent from us, you are not here. Come down, God, please, come down. That's his plea. You caused the nations to quake before you, verse 3. You, for when you did awesome things that we didn't expect, you came down. And the mountains trembled before you. This is amazing. Three times now he pleads, God, come down. Come down. All that we have treasured is destroyed. It is lost. 
It's in ruins. All that we treasured is gone. There is no hope for Israel. There is no hope for your people. Verse 8, but yet you are our father, and we are the clay, you are the potter, we are the work of your hand. There's still the acknowledgement that we are your people, but we're not seeing the hand of the potter upon this lump of clay. We're feeling formless, a lump of clay. So he goes on, he says, don't be angry beyond measure for this, don't remember our sins. But look upon us, we pray, for we are your people. We are your people. Where will this hope come from, and where will God come down? What has their soul treasured? They're waiting for God to come down. In fact, you see it mentioned a fourth time in verse 5. It may not be in the King James. It says um, to come down again. You come to the help of those who gladly do right. You come, God. Come down. That's our prayer. Come down and rescue us. Come down and give us hope. It's a desperate time. Yes, Deacon Harder, it is a bleak time. Excuse me, I meant to say Deacon Lee, but I got to hope again now. <laughs> it, is, it is a bleak, bleak time sorrowful, melancholy time in which it doesn't seem as though there is any hope and all his pleading for God to come down is falling on God's deaf ears. And for hundreds of years it will be this way where God is silent and he doesn't restore his people. Now if we turn to our scripture reading in chapter 2 of Luke, if we can go there next, because you know what, this is Christmas time, and God does not leave his people without hope. Amen? Amen. I'm telling you what, we may ask, you know, people, what, what I, I get so excited, I get tongue-tied, I, when I start thinking about sharing the gospel with people, I do. I do. When I think about giving the gospel to people, and I think, could, could, I, could I communicate the gospel to someone whose treasured life lies in ruins? You know, where most statistical, where the, where the bear of suicides occur in the time in the United States occurs during the holiday seasons? It is one of the most depressing times for a huge swath of the American public because they have no hope. Whatever they treasure lies in ruins. How many people do we know who, I know a good number, who uh, in their youth got married? Oh, everything's going to be wonderful. He's such a wonderful man. She's such a precious woman. It'll be great. It'll be wonderful. We'll have a family. We'll buy a house. We'll have a car, an SUV. We'll have a couple of kids. We'll even get a dog. Maybe we'll get some goldfish. It'll be perfect. And then all of a sudden it falls apart. The thing that you treasured is gone. It lies in ruins. God said, I'm not leaving you that way. I'm not going to leave you without hope. I'm going to come down. You asked me to come down. I'm going to come down. And I'm going to give you hope. Because you can't live in ruins. If you've seen pictures of places in the Middle East where uh, particularly the Egyptians and uh, even in some cases the Jordanians army has gone up against the ISIS army that has taken possession of cities. If you see a picture of the victorious army defeating ISIS in those cities, you know what's left of those cities? Rubble, ruin, uninhabitable, no services, no hospitals, no nothing, no water, no food, no infrastructure, no government. No way to even think about rebuilding and no way to make money. All they treasured is in ruins. It lies in ruins. God said, I came down, no matter what your circumstances are in ruins, I will come down and give you hope. 
is I will not permit my people, I will not permit my lumps of clay to live in ruins. That's a horrible, sinful way to live when I come down. And so in chapter 2 of Luke, what the ladies read this morning, this is powerful to me. And uh, it's a connection from the old, I mean, it seems maybe 64, Isaiah 64 doesn't seem particularly prophetic to you. It does to me. You don't have to agree with me. But I see a people who are hopeless, whose lives lie in ruins. All they treasure lies in ruins. All the dreams they had. Uh, for example, uh, sharing this morning about a man I, I talked to earlier in the week who my son and I always ask if we can deer hunt the last two days of muscle odor season on his property. And here is a man in his older life, he's in his 80s, and I knock on the door, Bob, how are you doing? Not very well. I see him once a year. That's all I know, I see him once a year. Bob, how are you doing? Not very well. Well, gee, I'm sorry to hear that. Uh, Anything I can do for you? Well, I said my wife died in the fall. As I fell and hurt my hip, I could barely walk, my knee hurts, I'm alone. He dreamt, probably, most of us do, dream about our older age, spending it quietly with our spouse and uh, surrounded by our children and grandchildren, like a courier in Ives or a Norman Rockwell picture. It doesn't always work out that way. But God says, your life doesn't have to be in that kind of ruin. I can give you something that will bring you back and restore you. And it's a wonderful thing. So when he says this, is so, I, I don't know, it's so exciting to me. These were these shepherds. This is, this is the shepherds, the joy candle, because they, they hear this from the angel. An angel, verse 9 of chapter 2 of Luke, the angel of the Lord appeared to the shepherds, and the glory of the Lord shone round about them, and they were terrified. I'd be terrified too. This hasn't happened in four, five, six hundred years where God has come down and communicated verbally in the presence of other human beings to a bunch of shepherds, the lowest of the low. They're out in their fields. Nobody gives them any credibility. Their lives are, are, I, I have to be careful how I say this. But when you grow up, or you're growing up, most men and women don't dream about the good life being a garbage truck driver. It's not a dishonorable job. Please don't misunderstand me. But is that the kind of dream we dream when we're young? Not usually. Does it provide sustenance and employment for those who do work on garbage trucks? Absolutely. Is it a job that's necessary? Absolutely. I'm not disparaging that job. Please don't misunderstand that. But it's not the kind of thing we dream about. My friend, uh, he was visited here back in the spring. John uh, basically had a nervous breakdown because the work he was in as a, as, a, as, a, as a marketing salesman for a manufacturing company in Rochester, the company uh, kind of began to decline very rapidly and it was put on his shoulders to try and save this company and the jobs of all the guys, the guys that worked out in the shop. And he couldn't do it. And he cracked. He was making multi-million dollar contracts and deals every week. Every week. You know what he's doing now? He works on the loading dock at Delphi. And he said to me, I never dreamed that I'd be working on the loading dock at Delphi. Now again, don't misunderstand me. Loading dock is an honorable job and one that's necessary. I'm not disparaging that, but that's not what he dreamt about. And all that he had, including the income he received from his sales job, has been reduced to bare minimum. He makes the minimum wage on the loading dock. From multi-million dollar sales to minimum wage. 
everything he held dear to them in the world. And if that were the only thing, he might contend with their errors. They were terrified when they, the, the angel came along. But the angel said, don't be afraid. I love this. What do you mean, don't be afraid? I've never seen anything like this before. You scared the living dickens out of me. You come down and you say, don't be afraid. Holy mackerel, I just thought I had a heart palpitation. I got cardiac arrest. I don't know. I've never, we've never seen anything like this before. We don't know even how to process this. But they do. Don't be afraid. I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. Now, do you wonder about this good news? The good news in Greek is the gospel. That's where it comes from. The gospel is the good news of great joy. And here the word great in Greek is megalang, which is what we get the word mega from. So when he says the gospel of mega good news is mega great joy. This is, his, this, this is like a superlative. That there is no better news that you can receive. That God is coming down and today in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. You see, God has come down. What you prayed for, Isaiah, in Isaiah 64 has now come true. It wasn't a pipe dream. It wasn't a dream. It wasn't a myth. It wasn't a fantasy. Now the reality is that Jesus Christ, God himself, has come down. Hallelujah and amen. Not only has he come down, but he is Christ the Lord. You know he is God, the very God. And it will be a sign to you. You will find the baby wrapped in cloths and lying in the manger. He has come down. This is indestructible joy. Because joy is authored by God coming down with the gospel. The good news of mega joy unsurpassed joy of confidence that all that we have may lie in ruins, but now we have God. We have Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord. He has come down. Do, do y'all get that connection from 60, Isaiah 64? It's sometimes hard to tell. I mean, I, I got to tell you, I'm impressed this morning because Carolyn stayed awake the whole time and, and, and her dad said she got done to work at 4 o'clock this morning. And look at her. Now, she's here. Now, I praise her for that. And, and I think that's a big deal. I really do because you know what? If Pastor Celia had gotten in at 4 o'clock in the morning, I'd have been calling Deacon uh, Lincoln saying, guess what? <laughs> You're preaching this morning. <laughs> but what is, how did I digress on that? I don't know. I'm, well, oh, I know, because Carolyn's still awake, and, and, and I'm impressed with that. I haven't put her to sleep yet. Or maybe she's practiced sleeping with her eyes open. <laughs> I think some of you have. <clears throat> I can't always see Linda's eyes, so I don't know if she's sleeping. Because of reflection in the glasses. That's why I bought it. Is that? <laughs> okay. All right. The problem is, about the only people in here who don't wear glasses is Deacon Bleak. And, and, well, then I, yeah. Yeah, there you go. No, no, it's too late for that. No. Including myself. I'm excited about this passage because it is the thing promised, the thing hoped for. It is restoration. It gives every human being, regardless of how their life is going, whether it's going great or going poorly, or going horribly, or if you're just simply overwhelmed by the goodness of God and don't give God credit, it is the important thing that God says, I come, I come down. I came down. I promised you I would, and I did. So for those of us today, we have the full benefit of that promise because he has come down and came.
came down to do everything that he promised to do. To redeem his people by his sacrifice, by his atoning blood. To all those who confess his name as Lord and Savior. It is indestructible because Christ is the author of it. There is not a single person in this room or anywhere in Christianity who should not have this abiding joy. The joy is spelled J-E-S-U-S. -E as long as we have Jesus, and we always will because he never changes, he never goes back on a promise, he never goes to sleep, he hears us always, he intercedes for us constantly, he is my King and Lord, that's joy. I am not alone bumping around out here in the wilderness of humanity. God dwells with me. Amen. It's such a beautiful, beautiful thing that God should do this for us. Isn't that amazing? What is there about me that God should care for me, that he should lay down his life for me? Huh? Think about that. But yet he's done it. He's come down. I'm so overwhelmed by that. Now, at the end of my outline there for you, it says there are sometimes, even though this joy is indestructible, Sometimes we can be robbed of joy. Have you ever noticed that? There's some things that kind of try and work their way in to steal the joy out of our lives. Sometimes it's our own sin. It's our lack of focus on Christ. You know, at this time of year, I went to Walmart the other day. I'm not a fan of Walmart. And I'm even a less so fan of Walmart during the Christmas season because I think everybody from five or six counties comes to Geneseo. And even trying to navigate the Walmart aisles is, is interesting. And <clears throat> while some people are pleasant, there are an awful lot of drunken people there. <coughs> and I'm thinking, it's Christmas, you're buying gifts, this should be this should be pretty much fun. But then again, I'm thinking, I'm in here buying Christmas gifts, and I'm not having fun. <laughs> so when this thought enters my mind, I start singing. It's not a Christmas carol. It's that uh, Burl Ives one. Have a holly jolly Christmas. It's the best time of the year. And I'll sing that while I'm going up and down the aisles, and people look at me, and they go, oh, boy. He looks strange. And then uh, when I get to that, if I, if I run into somebody who looks like they paused, I'll ask them, I'll say, Merry Christmas, how's it going? And I spent two hours in Walmart the other day just visiting with people. Very good. You laugh like you that. I'm, you, I, of course, old people do that, right? They do that. They get away with it. So, uh, yeah. Because there is good news that I possess in the form of Jesus Christ that is my joy, and I will not be robbed of it. I will not be robbed of that joy that I know in whom I have believed and am persuaded that He is able, one of my favorite verses, that He is able. There are all sorts of distractions. At the top of that sheet, I've given a kind of a compilation of verses where it says, For in the fullness of time God sent forth His Son, in whom the fullness of God was pleased to dwell, in order that we, who are full of condemning sin, might be fully emptied of our sin, and filled with all the fullness of God, and experience the fullness of joy. I just think that's the neatest compilation of a number of different verses that kind of, in one small place, puts together what joy is. This is a season of joy. Let's communicate joy to everybody that we see, because without Christ, there can be no joy. There can only be circumstances. There can also be personality. There can only be temperament. True joy is the joy of having Jesus Christ for the hope of all eternity. I hope that you indeed possess that joy and will share it with everybody you know. Let's pray. Father, bless us.
I thank you so much that we might come into your word and, and find the truth that your presence in the form of a baby in a manger 2,000 years ago is neither accidental, wasn't mythological, wasn't a fantasy, but the very truth about who God is and how much he loves each one of us, that he should sacrifice himself for me. The Christmas story is a beautiful Christmas story, but those of us who know that the Christmas story ends at Easter, and it's wonderful to think about the baby and the resurrection, but in between is a life for Christ who sacrificed everything for each one of us. He came down. God came down just as Isaiah begged him to. He came down to rescue us. And in order to rescue us, between Christmas and Easter morning, there is the crucifixion. There is the beating, the scourging, the hanging on the cross. Father, there aren't words enough to express our thankfulness for what you have done for us and given us inexpressible and indestructible joy that dwells in each one of us forever and ever. We bless your holy name. Amen.